program on peace building at, and rights at Columbia University's Institute for the Study of Human Rights. He was a former advisor to the US Department of State and the United States, United Nations Secretariat. Tara Azizi is with us. She is an international lawyer specializing in human rights. She worked with uh, UN agencies in the past on uh, human rights and worked with the Swedish Migration Agency, which I believe brings a lot of uh, expertise regarding, uh, regarding refugees uh, escaping Iranian oppression. We are also joined by Arish Saleh, the representative of the Democratic Party of Iranian Kurdistan to the United States. Uh, the KDPI is a Kurdish dissident party with militant activity inside Iran, especially in uh, the Kurdish inhabited parts of, uh, of Western Iran, uh, which we are keen to hear about his political uh, insights into the situation. We are also together with Salah Beyazidi, the representative of the Komala party to the United States. Komala is another Kurdish dissident party with political and limited scale militant activity in, inside Iran. Both of these political parties are uh, exiled in, in Iraqi Kurdistan region uh, where the recent wave of airstrikes uh, by Iran were conducted. Um, before we start, we'd like to pay our respects to the uh, uh, the fallen uh, civilians in, and uh, any Iranian activists over the uh, past 14 days uh, by keeping silent for 30 seconds. Thank you very much for joining me in, in silence. Let me give a very brief overview of what's happening in Iran for, uh, for our viewers who may not be familiar with uh, all the details. As of today, uh, 76 people have been reported killed by the Norway-based Norway uh, Iran Human Rights Organization. Um, it, is, uh, it is imperative to mention that the official number is 41. It's still a significant number of, uh, of, of that toll uh, in accordance with, uh, with the Iranian government sources. The protest movement in Iran started 14 days ago on 16 September after uh, a Kurdish woman died in custody of the Iranian morality police, Gina Mahzamini. She has been the the center of the, the protest movement ever since it started. And uh, interestingly, so uh, the, uh, the protest turned into a unifying factor for entire Iran and not only the Kurds, which is an interesting uh, point that we will be discussing today. The majority of these protests have been in Iranian Kurdistan, namely the Kurdish inhabited regions, um, where According to Kurdish sources, which I would be very happy to hear from uh, from Arish and, and Salah, uh, that the number of the people who have been killed, uh, wounded, or detained uh, has reportedly been much uh, larger than the rest of Iran. The protest movement of 2022 differs from uh, previous protest movements in, in Iran in uh, several aspects. The first is this is one of the largest that Iran has seen, perhaps the largest since 2009. Um, but the biggest difference is that uh, the protest movement of today has no unified or centralized leadership or doesn't have any leader symbols. Uh, unlike 2009 um, or previous protest movements in Iran ever since the revolution, 
uh, took place in 1979. That said, another distinct feature of the <laughs> protest movement this year is the diversified issues that the protest movement is touching upon. Women and Iran's, the Iranian regime's control over women, body, and appearance is one of the central themes of these protests, but we have recently been hearing from Iranian groups that it's beyond, uh, and uh, not only about how women are treated by the Iranian regime. That said, Kurdish groups, uh, especially the Kurdish exiled groups, have been uh, participating in global action, uh, calling for justice for Kurdish women in Iran. I'd like to mention here, for me, the most interesting point is that a traditionally Kurdish uh, motto, slogan, uh, women, life, and freedom has been translated into, into Farsi and now being used by uh, protesting masses across the country and, and beyond, um, which uh, I believe an important point that has to be uh, discussed to understand uh, how the relations between the Kurdish community and the non-Kurdish community of Iran is changing in the light of these protests. And finally, uh, widespread cross-border bombardment of Kurdish positions in the Iraqi Kurdistan region has happened yesterday, um, marking an interesting and unprecedented uh, milestone in Iran's cross-border operations against the Kurdish groups in Iraqi Kurdistan, because um, <clears throat> by the number of attacks happened over the past few days, it exceeds far uh, beyond the uh, previous Iranian cross-border cross uh, operations in Iraqi Kurdistan. Without further ado, I'd like to start with David Phillips. And uh, I want to ask the question that everybody wants to know. Why is it very hard to topple the Iranian regime? Can a protest movement, whether widespread or not, will ever be able to uh, bring about a regime change in Iran? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to join today's panel. I'm always pleased to associate with the Washington Kurdish Institute, which is the leading voice in DC on behalf of Kurdish issues. This panel comes at a particularly important time uh, in the wake of violent protests across Iran that were catalyzed by the murder of Masa Amini by Iran's morality police on September 16, 2022. She was arrested for failing to cover her hair modestly in accordance with the hijab law, a relic of the Islamic revolution that was adopted in 1981 and is still used by conservative clerics to justify their militant male theocracy. <coughs> Though Masa was Kurdish, protests involve Iranians of various ethnic backgrounds who were chafing under Iran's authoritarian rule. Mostly the Iranian people are fed up with the country's mismanaged economy, rampant corruption, its ineffective response to the COVID crisis, repression, and social restrictions. <coughs> Chance of no to hijab, no to repression, only equal rights are increasing across the country. Women are opposing gender apartheid, demanding an end to the hijab law, and calling for abolition of the morality police. Women are on the front line demanding reform of the divorce law that shows preferences to men, laws that grant men exclusive custody of children, rules that allow polygamy for men. They are opposing laws that lower the marriage age for girls and require women to get permission from their husbands or fathers to travel. Women have been playing a leading role in political and social revolutions elsewhere. Let me cite a few examples here. First in Burma, when Aung San Suu Kyi led protests against the State Law and Order Restoration Council. 
Uh, she won the Nobel Prize in 1991, but she ended up jailed by the Slork successor and is today imprisoned. In Liberia, Leigh McGrovey and Ellen Sirleaf Johnson led the revolution against the participants in a civil war, and they were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize in 2011. In Brazil, Gilma Rousseff mobilized opposition to the military dictatorship. She became president in 2011 until her impeachment by political opponents five years later in 2016. And also in the United States, we see women taking a leading role. The Women's March in DC in 2017, I remember attending with my teenage daughters as they shouted, love not hate makes America great. More recently, women protesters against the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe versus Wade have shifted the political dynamics here in the US. Iranians, men included, are increasingly joining the movement and demanding political reform. They are protesting hypocrisy of the regime and autocratic rule of President Ibrahim Raisi an ultra conservative who tightened strict social and religious rules when he was chosen more than one year ago. His draconian rules have exacerbated social tensions. Women who are not covered properly are barred from the subway and from receiving social services. Iran's Ministry of Guidance instructed movie theaters to shop, stop showing women in their advertisements. Women are arbitrarily arrested and sent for re-education. Instead of recognizing that unrest that is spreading across the country is the result of its domestic policies, the IRGC launched cross-border missile and drone attacks yesterday on Iraqi Kurdistan, killing scores of people uh, and injuring many. Attacks hard targeted the headquarters of the Kurdistan Freedom Party, the Kurdistan Party of Kurdistan of Iran, the Democratic Party of Kurdistan of Iran, PDKI, the Party for a Free Life for Kurdistan, and Komala in the provinces of Soleimani and Erbil. Tehran calls these organizations terrorist groups. Yesterday's escalation dramatizes the high stakes that Iran is facing these days. Raisi and the IRGC are trying to solve a problem by creating a bigger one. Iranians of all ethnicities, men and women alike, find violence to be intolerable. They want genuine political transition in Iran towards a federal parliamentary democracy. If the regime stands in the way, then the regime should be removed. The Cooperation Center adopted a joint statement this summer that was endorsed by the Democratic Party of Iranian Kurdistan, the Kurdistan Democratic Party of Iran, and the Kamala Party of Iranian Kurdistan. The statement embraced federalism as the most effective system for power sharing and enshrining the rule of law. Signatories reject Iran's centralization and concentration of power. They believe that federalism is the most efficient system of government to safeguard equality and non-discrimination, to protect and promote the unique identity of groups. The joint statement called for the establishment of self-governing institutions, a local executive, assembly, and judiciary, as well as police and security structures upholding the administration of justice and reflecting the communities that they serve. It calls for cultural rights in the form of education, language, media, cultural festivals, and cultural symbols. It also addresses economic de development through local control of natural resources, property, and land management, as well as hiring preferences. With protests sweeping across the country, we must acknowledge that Iran is on the cusp of dramatic change.
This is instigated by Iranians, not external forces. President Joe Biden wants to help the protesters communicate and organize. U.S. officials have been focused on renewing the JCPOA. They believe it is important, but they increasingly understand that Iran will only stop being a threat when there is regime change or the regime dramatically changes its behavior. Through decentralization, other sweeping democratic reforms, and the creation of accountable government. I'm pleased to give this overview of recent developments to address the recent cross-border attacks and to share with you the result of discussions that Columbia University and the Washington Kurdish Institute held with Iranian Kurdish partners, looking at governance strategies in the future that would decentralize power through federal arrangements. I'll thank stop here and look forward you. to getting questions later in the discussion. Thank, thank you, David, thank you. Um, let me move to, um, to Tara. Tara, I have uh, some particular questions to you that I took notes before coming here, because I believe you bring the perspectives of a woman, an Iranian, a Kurdish, and a human rights defender. Could you give us a very small overview of the past 14 days and what is happening and how are these are uh, observed from your perspectives, this diverse perspectives you have? Uh, first of all, just wanna say thank you so much to the Washington Kurdish Institute for arranging this well needed and important webinar that we're having today. And thank you for inviting me. Um, what we've seen the past, the past days is being ongoing for so many days in Iran, started in the Kurdish areas um, where women, men and women, Kurdish men and women were chanting women, life and freedom. And their chanting made it all the way from Kurdistan to Tehran, where demonstrations and, and people who participated from different minorities in Iran were chanting in Kurdish and Farsi, women, life, freedom. So this really created a women's rights movement that united uh, the people of Iran, that united them in, in their fight against injustice, in their fight for their basic human rights, in their fight for accountability. Um, the death of Gina Amini, who was a Kurdish young woman, um, really created a rage amongst the Iranian people, not only the Kurdish people, we see that in all over Iran. Um, and I think that the Iranian people, they've suffered from oppression for so many years and they've had enough of, of systematic discrimination. They've had enough of something that we've been talking more about recently, intersectional discrimination. They've had enough of what also Dr. Philip mentioned, gender apartheid in Iran. Uh, so all of these factors, but also we have to mention the bad economy in the country, um, the high rate of unemployment in the country, um, well-educated women and men being unemployed, especially lack of job opportunities in, in remote areas outside of Tehran, um, and lack of equal particip political participation for, for all of Iran's people. So I think all of these factors um, alongside Jean Amini's death created a rage and, and a movement that we see is hard for the Iranian regime to stop. Um, I think that the uprising and the struggle in the Kurdish areas, it also goes back to, to the establishment of, of the Iranian regime. Um, many people in Iran, they've never voted for this constitution. They've never voted for these laws that is constantly discriminating women. Uh, women are, women's rights are severely restricted in Iran. This is not something new. And we've seen demonstrations in the past in Iran. But what's interesting with, with these events and these uh, demonstrations is that the atten international attention of it and the attention that human rights organizations and human rights lawyers are giving to it. And the reports that we are receiving from Iran, despite the, the restriction of internet access in Iran, we have received a lot of information, uh, information about severe human rights violations and the regime cracking down on certain areas such as the Kurdish areas, but also other uh, minorities in Iran. We have to remember that um, 
I think is more than half of the population in Iran are belongs to an ethnic or religious minority. So this this struggle, this this fight against injustice is unifying the country. And this is, of course, a threat towards the Iranian regime. Um, they're cracking down with severe human rights violations. I get a lot of reports from organizations, different well-established organizations, although I cannot independently verify these numbers. Uh, but we've seen the past days that they're they're cracking down on, on some parts of the country, such as the Kurdish areas, using severe violence uh, against protesters. Um, and women are, unfortunately, always when it comes to conflict areas, I've, I've been, I have experience of different areas and countries working with human rights, women are targeted. Um, so these intersectional perspectives that I would say in the past demonstrations when we've been observing human rights violations in Iran have not been applied that much, but now that's a positive effect. People are talking about increasing the intersectional uh, perspective when reporting about human rights violations in Iran today. Um, the international uh, community are giving more attention to what's going on in Iran. Um, UN agencies, uh, also the UN, uh, but we see um, a unification uh, from the international attention that is very good through social media, journalists, human rights activists. Um, so I think that human rights reporting and, and monitoring is, is one thing, and that needs to be continued the, the, the upcoming days. So and we need to follow the situation in Iran. But also when we have this attention and, and these reports, um, this also makes it easier for us to make sure that perpetrators can be held accountable in the future. I have this question to you that I really want to hear from uh, the uh, Kurdish human rights uh, defender perspective, mm -hmm. which is um, so Kurdistan or the Kurdish inhabited areas, the Kurdish uh, question, whatever you want to call it, also represent a, a deep issue, a source of conflict for Iran that goes past and uh, beyond the Islamic uh, revolution. And today in Iran, a Kurdish uh, slogan is being uh, translated into to Farsi. And you also mentioned that uh, the masses are chanting Kurdish slogans. This may not bring about any change in the Iranian regime or <clears throat> the regime may survive this crisis as well. But do you think um, such incorporation of Kurdish political uh, characteristics by the Iranian, Persian Iranian community can also ease the tensions between uh, Iranian Kurds and, and the rest of the country when it comes to uh, the so-called Kurdish issue. Uh, thank you. It's a very interesting question. Um, as I mentioned, um, this 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 uprising, this 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 movement, this women's rights movement and human rights movements in Iran um, have created a unified unification amongst Iran's people. And I think that the Iranian regime are turning to desperate methods in, in their way of increasing their violence against its people, all of its people, not only the Kurdish people, but again, they see the Kurds as the reason to, to this demonstration because it started in the Kurdish areas. I think this is positive. This The Iranian people are showing solidarity. They are united. They are united against the Iranian regime and their um, their way of severely restricting their rights, uh, systematically restricting uh, the rights of the Iranian people. So I think this is this is a positive outcome. I would say that this uh, movement is so widespread. We see in all of Iran, all of Iran are protesting, and we see them using Kurdish and Farsi slogans. But also in other minorities, such as Baluch Lors, are gathering within this movement. And this is also why Iran so desperately is cracking down and increasing its violence against its people, because they know that unification amongst the Iranian people is something that is threatened their their institution, their constitution, their laws that they want to put upon the Iranian people. So I think this is a positive outcome. And, and I hope to see more of that in the future because they're all oppressed. Their, their human rights are severely restricted in Iran. Um, we have to apply intersectional perspective 
that also will increase the understanding amongst the different people in Iran. So this is positive, but this is also threatening the Iran. That's why we see the desperate move of uh, targeting not only Iranian citizens, uh, Iranian people in Iran, but also targeting uh, Kurdish, Iranian Kurdish refugees, women and children, civilians, innocent in, in, in Iraq, in the Kurdish part of Iraq. Mm -hmm. so this is, we see the moves are desperate because the people of Iran are unified and the international attention is good to Taurus. There's, I think that the international supporters and attention knows that, that the people of Iran are united and their, their struggle against for human rights is a struggle for all of Iran. Thank you, Tara. I initially wanted to uh, continue with Salah, but given that uh, you mentioned the uh, cross-border attacks in, uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan, and I believe most of them targeted the KDPI fortifications in Iraqi Kurdistan, I'd like to uh, ask uh, the question to, to Arish. Arish, David Phillip and Tara mentioned several important points, uh, which I believe some of them should be answered by you as well. One is, uh, David said Iran is on the verge of a dramatic change or might be on the verge of a dramatic change. And Tara mentioned uh, two significant points, in my opinion. One of them was uh, the uh, protest movement united the Iranian people, which might be the first time in history. Um, and the unification came about uh, with the incorporation of, uh, of Kurdish political characteristics, slogans, or the discourse, whatever you want to call it. Is KDPI, it is subsidiaries, partners, and friends uh, involved in these protests, or are the Kurdish groups, the Kurdish dissidents, uh, being involved in, in, in this protest movement? And why do you think um, the Kurdish political discourse is being adapted by the rest of Iran in the light of these protest movements? Well, thank you so much, Jang, and thanks, uh, many thanks for WKI for this timely uh, uh, webinar. So uh, your question has two different parts. Let's start with the first part, whether uh, we as Kurdish political parties play any role in this uprisings, recent uprisings. Uh, well, actually, uh, Kurdish political parties have a strong base, and they have been active for a long time and uh, you know people in uh, there is a good relationship between people in Iranian Kurdistan civil society in Iranian Kurdistan and the Kurdish political parties whenever we have asked people to uh, go on a strike uh, they do so and uh, this shows some sort of you know strong base in Iranian Kurdistan but you know as uh, it, it was mentioned previously the case of Gina Amini as you know, the, the, the intersection of two different major issues in Iran. One, ethnic uh, discrimination and ethnic issues in Iran. And from, from other side, it's like, uh, you know, the, the women issues and the, the control of state over women's uh, bodies. Uh, these two different issues have always been able to mobilize people in large scales. This time, uh, putting these two together actually made it uh, even more strong, even stronger in terms of, you know, mobilization, people being able to get together and, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, control the streets in various cities. Uh, the Iranian government has always been uh, trying to uh, blame its issues and its problems and what happens in Iran and, you know, political parties and foreign states, uh, on United States and uh, various parties that are actually not involved in this. But uh, it is imperative that we understand that the issue that is going on inside Iran is a, collect a collection of lots of grievances in the past few years, lots of uh, cleavages in the past few years, and demands that have not been uh, responded pro properly. That is correct that uh, Kurdish political parties have strong base and they have good relationship with the people inside Iran. But it doesn't say anything about, you know, uh, uh, something being, uh, you know, orchestrated by parties. Can we understand this, that you, you support the movement? 
Definitely, you know, the Kurdish political parties have supported the movement. The Kurdish political parties have played role in, you know, uh, mobilizing people, organizing people inside Iranian Kurdistan. But this issue, you know, that uh, this uh, uprisings are not something that, you know, uh, Kurdish political parties wanted to, uh, or, or somehow, you know, orchestrated in the whole Iran. It is, uh, it is true that uh, Kurdish political parties basically asked for a uh, strike in Iranian Kurdistan. People, uh, you know, responded to that. And, uh, 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 you know, Iranians, uh, Kurdish Iranian society uh, basically respond, uh, responded to the request from the Kurdish political parties uh, and uh, took to the streets and basically started the, uh, the uprising. But from there, and, you know, going to the other sides of Iran, other cities in Iran, more than 80 cities in uh, Iran were involved in those protests. Uh, going, know, back to, going, going back to Tara's point um, of unification of the people of Iran and unification of international attention, um, the diversification of the issue, um, it is not the first time that Kurdish masses are involved in a popular movement in Iran. In 1905, the... Uh, constitutional revolution protests, 1977 to 1979, the protests leading to the Islamic revolution had this Kurdish footprint at large. Um, and each time the Kurds had high hopes that the, the ethnic issues might be set aside for the greater good of the Iranian people. Are you concerned as the Kurdish parties that this case might repeat that uh, the Kurdish masses may get involved in uh, protests against, or uh, popular movements against the Iranian regime, but in the end, uh, still not achieve their ethnic or, or ethno-nationalist uh, ambitions? Well, that is well, a good is, question. Is, is this the part of it? Is this, uh, do, do the Kurdish movements view these popular movements and uprisings as a way to achieve uh, ethno-nationalist ambitions? Well, that is a good question, Kai Jang. Yes, basically, Kurdish people in, inside Iranian Kurdistan have some specific demands. Oh, you know, uh, different movements inside Iran have uh, different uh, uh, demands. At this point, this the you know uh, this demands have been uh, concentrated on one thing, and that is the uh, you know toppling the regime. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are giving up on other demands that we have inside. Uh, Iranian Kurdistan. There are specifically demands for uh, ethnic rights and uh, human rights issues that you know uh, have been there even before this regime. And if we don't do uh, any structural, if we don't reach any structural uh, uh, solution for these issues, they're going to last even if the regime actually changes and topples. So yes, there is always this concern that you know as we saw it in Iraqi Kurdistan, as we saw it in the history of Iran, the Kurds, Kurdish movement gets involved heavily, pays a heavy price at the end of the road. You know, we're uh, facing a situation that nothing has changed basically in terms of ethnic rights, in terms of, you know, the rights of Kurdish people to be able to determine their future. So uh, basically th th this, uh, this, this kind of fear, uh, may be overcome by, uh, by uh, the, the, the strength of uh, mobilization that uh, we see in the case of Gina, but it doesn't mean that it goes away. It doesn't mean that it is, an, it is not a rational uh, threat there. It, it is a rational threat because the issues that we have with uh, dominant nationalisms in Iran is not that they don't accept us. Yes, they accept us as little brothers uh, it's not that they don't say we're not there in Iran. Yes, they say we are there in Iran, but we are little brothers. It's okay if they use uh, Kurdish slogans, but it doesn't mean that using Kurdish slogans doesn't mean basically that they, they're they using, uh, you know, a, as you mentioned, uh, Kurdish perspective or Kurdish discourse in, in this case. But quite contrary, still, I believe the uh, nationalism, the Iranian nationalism discourse is still strong and it uh, in a Persian society, and that nationalism is uh, entails basically uh, looking at ethnicities as some sort of little brothers. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, as long as this mentality is not changed, I don't believe that even the change of the regime change is going to make any differences for uh, Kurdish issue. Uh, but still, you know, these different uh, movements that are going on in uh, in Iran, uh, they, you know, the main signifier that, you know, the signifier that they can all uh, agree upon as the change in regime, because we believe if the regime changes, we're going to face a situation where we can have some sort of, if you may, a, a new social contract between us, mm-hmm. something that, you know, we can get together, discuss our issues and reach a kind of, you know, agreement among different political parties who represent different uh, groups in Iran. And this social contract builds a new Iran, of, uh, 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 the Iran of future. Thank you, Ari. Salah. Could, I, could I weigh in here? When Arash speaks about a structural change, I think what he's referring to is a different arrangement between Iran's regions, a federal democratic republic where the powers of the central government are curtailed, where there's extensive decentralization, and where federal entities enter into an agreement with one another in order to advance their unique characteristics. And that agreement addresses three categories. Governance, which is decentralized with local control, cultural issues, whereby the cultural rights and freedom of expression are guaranteed, and then local economy, which is control of natural resources, ownership, and hiring preferences. It's fine to go out and chant slogans, It's good therapy, particularly in a country that has ruled through tyranny for so long. But unless there's a structural remedy that Iranians can agree on, there's little prospect of seeing real progress. That's why I was so heartened over two years to see the Kurdish political parties come together, debate their ambitions for the future, and then adopt a joint statement affirming federal parliamentary democracy as the best system for guaranteeing their interests. David, I will have more strategic questions to you very shortly after after Salah. Salah, sorry for keeping you waiting for too long. Uh, uh, you know, it's the, the, the issues are so convoluted that we have to talk a lot. But I'd like to, um, to directly ask you this question. Do you expect the regime change? And if not, why? why popular movements, protest groups, widespread civilian violence in Iran never brings about a regime change in Iran. Is this because the Iranian government and Republican guards, this, uh, the, the, the revolutionary guards are two distinct ent- entities and they require different solutions to be dealt with? Or is this because the Iranian regime has always kept a, um, a some sort of a control over these masses. Why is it very difficult to change the regime in Iran? And is this possible? Is it possible? Is the change possible to come from within Iran and not uh, with outside intervention? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for Washington Kurdish Institute and other friend uh, who uh, they arrange this meeting. I think it's where we are going through and present the time. Uh, you, Jeng, you ask me a very difficult question. You know, I That's why I invited you. Thank you. Still <laughs> people debating, even if it's a revolution, you know, it's what what we are witnessing. I know we have uh, all, uh, just a common point, few things. What is this uprising, if you call it uprising, and is different from previous one. We had a one in 2009, Green uh, Revolution, the Green Movement. Then we had a three years ago and previously. But what we have, we have a different now situation. Previously, we usually we didn't have the, as the thing that I guess discussed, we didn't have this kind of uh, close cooperation among Iranian ethnic groups. We saw very common s- slogans around Iran. We saw the first time since 2009, the return of the university students. And university students, when they were suppressed in 2009, they were not uh, present you know, uh, than previous last uh, 12, 14 years ago. So the students returned. We have a city, 
which is always like center of religion, for like city of Gong, which is a, a religious religious school that they are burning the you know the the security forces vehicles in the Mashhad, even the city of like Khomein, you know, or a city like Kerman, which is just three years ago it was center of the funeral for Qasem Soleimani. The news said over close to hundred people died. They're burning his huge banner in the city. So we are, and more importantly, we're seeing very, very young people. And again, importantly, the women are the forefront of this struggle. So we are going through very unprecedented, very new phase of the revolution in Iran. If is this revolution going to uh, bring down this regime? Uh, really is difficult to say, but I'm sure, uh, I'm sure, you know, all dictators, if you look at, uh, we have experienced the history, like what happened, like in Romania, you know, this hours before the dictator didn't, didn't, did not accept his defeat. Just look at the uh, Soviet Union event. Let's look at all the, you know, just, uh, you know, Arab Spring, you know, dictator in Egypt or around the world. They did not accept the reality it's changing yes i the the time before death of the gina amini before that and now is changed the the clock cannot be turned back to the what happening this is really we, we seeing uh, you know and is developing further in, i know a regime trying to do some same tactics you know they 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 filter the the social media, you know, we have no internet in most of part of Iran, but the the protest is continued. You know, is they using different tactics? Maybe uh, we are don't have much protest in a smaller city, which was the the first week of protest. But most the big the largest city we have a center of this this uprising is continued. They trying to do at night. And now we are going to second phase of this uprising, which is the uh, we have more strike, general strike among different groups. You know, the, the different the truck drivers probably go to the you know the to the energy sectors and to so other and the, to the teaching teachers. So and now we have a strikes, general strike by to the students, university students, and and the schools around the country. So it's we are. Have some similarity with what happened in 1979, as previous weeks and months. Uh, so, if you remember, in 1979, when bring down one of the powerful military regimes in Middle East, it just happened in two days. You know, the, the, the final days of the uh, two days when the people finally had to hand their gun and they bring down the regime. Uh, it was very slow. Just the weeks before the, the 1979 revolution it was just we had strikes in the, in the especially gen, you know in the energy sector in the bazaar you know which is very famous for Iran's economy market so we are we see some similarity plus more important we see that all the even though the, the internet is really uh, down in Iran but see the world is eyes on on what happening in Iran. Uh, so I, I definitely I can see the this regime is passing through its uh, final phases. I can't say it's going to happen tomorrow or next week or within a month, but definitely we are going through the, its, its final phases. When eventually, because uh, w something happened, you know, in 1979 the Kurds were among the first group. You are, you know, they did not accept this, you know, the, this regime, you know. The Kurds did not vote for uh, Islamic Republic referendum on April 1979 with majority no. Then the Kurds uh, against the, the you know they have a they armed struggle in 80s for, for a decade. So eventually Kurds always been forefront of uh, this struggle. But I, the, yeah, I, I understand that you support the the uprising. Arish said their party had no structural organizational involvement in what's going on in Iranian Kurdistan at the moment. So I ask the same question. If this is so similar to 1979 and prone to bring about big change, as the Kormala party, are you involved in what's going on in Iran today, directly or indirectly? Uh, you know, this is not something uh, we can say this has been engineered, you know. 
it's something we 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 plan this thing i know uh, something so it could be you know just look at the uh, arab spring happened you know this young man burned himself in morocco you know so when Gina Amini news come, I think it was because uh, contribute to it. Why, when his body returned to the city, Kurdish city of Sakbaz, you know, to, to his family, did not accept to bury him at night. So that was a really crucial moment, you know. If it was happened, probably it would be lost that moment. Then it was daytime when the people in the Sakbaz and around Kurdish city they attended to the funeral, and it was a thing to the. Uh, the social media it, it reported around the world uh, and then uh, the center for cooperation of kurdish parties it announced the day after the general strike in kurdistan and eventually it, it you know it it, it spread to rest of iran and rest of iran uh, then day by day that uh, first four or five days so uh, they come into common ground so i think we should look at this uh, you know this uh, map, you know, uh, how this thing spread. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, we have uh, some engineer to uh, the Kurdish party or, but of course, uh, our Kurdish party not coming from the Mars, you know, we are also part of these people, you know, who's on the ground. So we, it could be sympathizer, it could be, you know, people who are uh, the Kurdishness and find, you know, their interest in which is national struggle. Thank you, Salah. Uh, sorry, Jeng. Can I add something here? So, to give uh, a better perspective and to give you a background about what what is going on and what, what's going on in Iranian Kurdistan and how Kurdish political parties can play a role or can play a role in the future, you know, Kurdish political parties, as I mentioned, have very good relationship with society, civil society, in different parts of society in Iranian Kurdistan. Uh, whenever they have asked people inside Iranian Kurdistan to go to strike, to uh, do some uh, civil actions there, we receive very good responses from them. This time also, the gravity of the situation, uh, you know, Gina was killed and the situation there for, for a few days, she was uh, in hospital in coma. Now it uh, gathered lots of attention in Iranian Kurdistan, as I mentioned two different strong factors were present there. So the uh, the background was ready to, you know, the, uh, the ground was ready to do some actions there. So basically uh, Kurdish political parties, the center, the center for cooperation basically asked people to go on and strike after the death of Gina. And the people did so. And uh, then after that, uh, this cooperation center also say to continue the strike with uh, demonstrations inside streets at uh, uh, five, five this p.m. Was the, this was the reason for the cross-border airstrikes on several Kurdish political uh, party positions in Iraq and Kurdistan over the past week. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, go, go to that also. Five p.m. Basically, they uh, they asked people to uh, uh, take it to the streets, and they did so. And then, because the, uh, in other parts of Iran, also women were able to somehow connect with this issue. Uh, this sp spilled over to, to other parts of Iran. Definitely, Kurdish political parties play a role in uh, not in terms of you know orchestrating the whole thing, but in terms of asking people to act and they get the response. But, you know, the Iranian government ha is, has this intention to, or has this, you know, a tendency to basically uh, blame things on others. And uh, uh, when you're in the street, when you get arrested, they say, okay, you, you know, you are working for PDKI and that's where you can be, uh, you know, you can face, uh, you, you can face even death penalty in Iran. Uh, and they can use, you know, this, uh, the words that we are using here or some other places to basically uh, do that, to uh, take those words to the courts and use them as documents to show that, yes, there is a relationship between this guy who has been protesting inside the streets of Iran, in, for example, Qom in Tehran, in Mashhad, with this political party that we consider um, illegal that is outside and they're trying to topple us. So uh, a, a very heinous crime has happened there. So we can actually uh, crack down on them uh, more harshly and we can actually 
you know, uh, they, they can face death penalty, as I mentioned. But in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, the, the issue, yes, basically, I believe uh, the Iranian government did so because they, uh, they wanted to, you know, this, this, th- this was an unprovoked and unjustified attack on our basis, because they wanted to divert the attention, the international attention from the issues inside Iran. And as you know, Jake Solomon mentioned, they wanted to find a remedy for the situation inside Iran, outside its borders. Uh, this, this, this has been the policy of Iran. This has been a strategy uh, uh, by Iranian regime to basically do so any anytime something happens a crisis happens inside Iran that threatens the regime they're trying to find to create um, a, a bigger crisis outside their borders so that they can actually control the crisis inside so this uh, the, the remedy of uh, crisis is creating more crisis and mentality of Iranian thank history. you Ari. thank you Tara um, we spoke with the uh, Salah and Arish Uh, representing two political parties. So, and Salah made this point that there are so many similarities between what's happening today in Iran and what happened in 1979 and during the years that led to the Islamic Revolution in 1979 with regards to Kurdish involvement, with regards to uh, the involvement of civil society, with regards to, to the pace of the events, how they unfold. Uh, overnight and unprecedentedly and, uh, and, and suddenly to bring about a structural change. To what extent do you agree that, uh, that the, the large-scale protest movement of today uh, has similarities with 1979 uh, with regards to its capacity to bring about change? Oh, that's, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm going to give it short. Um, okay, so... The, the Kurds and other minorities in Iran, but in particular the Kurds, they have, as I told you even before, experienced many, many years of oppression and systematic discrimination. And this is not only me saying, this is supported by the UN Special Rapporteur, well-established human rights organizations. As I am a human rights lawyer, I can just give you this information. Ten, the Kurds are 10% of Iran's total population, but they represent 50% of the political prisoners in Iran right now. You don't need to be a human rights lawyer to realize that that's very disproportional. That this oppression, it's been ongoing for many, many years, even before the, the Islamic constitution came into power. So the, the severe oppress against this minority and the, the severe violence that the regime, disproportional severe violence that the regime is increasing in the Kurdish area goes back to the history that we have, the Kurds have. Um, and as also been mentioned, um, when we're saying that this is a united movement in Iran, that people are together chanting for women, life, freedom, um, it's, too, it's too soon to jump into any conclusion to say this will happen or that will happen. But what we can say is that the Iranian regime They have not changed their strategy. They have just increased violence. Mm-hmm. And before the Kurds have in the history and still are, are um, demanding equal political participation as all of the other minorities, because the constitution, the Iranian constitution is not giving the minor- minorities that. So that needs to be in place in order for the, for the Kurds and other minorities to feel participated and to feel participated with the institutions. Um, but to answer very quickly on your question, yes, uh, the Kurds have a history of, of, of di- disproportional uh, oppression against them. Thank you, Tara. Um, David, it's time for my strategic questions to you, um, unless you want to add something first. But I would like to understand from a geostrategic perspective, uh, what manifestations can these uh, uh, protests uh, bring about in the near future or distant future uh, with regards to uh, Iran in the regional scene and Iran's influence over the region? Um, we've seen that uh, the first retaliation or the mitigation strategy that, that Iran adopted after, in the wake of the protests were cross-border attacks on Iraqi Kurdistan um, and before then uh, blaming um, the so-called Western conspiracy, the U.S., uh, for, for the unrest in the country. These might be uh, for diverting the attention uh, from 
um, in, in, in inside Iran, diverting the public attention from what's happening on, on the streets. But it is definitely in a crisis mode, I mean, Iran. So will this crisis mode uh, have any uh, impact on Iran's regional activities, Iran's regional influence, uh, possibly making, making it more aggressive or trying to maintain the status quo? So Ambassador Richard Holbrook, with whom I worked, used to say of Slobodan Milosevic, that he tries to solve a problem by creating a bigger one. What's happened here is pretty clear. The regime is trying to distract the Iranian people by blaming others instead of taking responsibility itself for its failure in governance and economy. So by attacking Iraqi Kurds, it's sending a dual message that the Kurds are to blame and Iraqi Kurdistan, which has been a project of the United States, is also to blame. It's a way of avoiding responsibility, of shirking uh, responsibility to take remedial steps. But it's a, it's a well-worn tactic among tyrants and dictators to try to broaden the crisis, to distract the people from its own failings. And I think this gets to the important point of how do we anticipate a tipping point? In other situations, it's hard to predict when we reach a tipping point. What are the factors that bring us to that stage? So in Iran, what are the factors that are going to bring us to uh, a change of regime? Uh, it could be the armed forces who feel as though they're not being treated fairly. It could be business or economic leaders who feel as though they're disadvantaged. The important thing here that the revolution in Iran is not going to be led by Iranian Kurds only. It's going to be inclusive and involve all the Iranian people. So for that to happen, the, the statement that the Iranian Kurdish parties issued on a federal parliamentary democracy needs to be more broadly disseminated. It should be shared with other ethnicities so that they can come on board. There should be a shared vision of what kind of government in the future will allow Iran to move forward and to represent the interests of its diverse polity. I actually have a follow-up question, David, and you touched upon the question I, uh, I, I wrote for you before even I, I come to that. Um, very interesting that you mentioned who will bring about the change in Iran, who will be the main actor of change is not known from today. Definitely not the Kurdish masses, but might be the armed forces who are dissatisfied with the current regime and everything else. There are some uh, theories about uh, the, the current status of the Iranian regime is that uh, the regime, the government and the uh, revolutionary guards are two distinct entities and uh, popular movements opposing the Tehran government may not be seen or might not be seen as uh, as a threat to uh, the Pazdaran, the Revolutionary Guards. In other words, there are serious allegations and claims that the Revolutionary Guards is a regime within a regime. So uh, a new revolution in Iran cannot be achieved without foreign intervention because when it reaches the tipping point, as you mentioned, uh, it will witness a brutal intervention from the well-prepared, battle-hardened, and ideologically driven revolutionary guards. Do you agree with this? Do you agree that uh, it is almost impossible to, to achieve these goals without foreign intervention? So it's important that the movement for change occur organically from within the country. The US can broaden internet access, can play a discrete role. But as we saw previously, we don't want the regime to accuse external forces of trying to engineer its demise. To be sustainable, it has to come up from uh, within or by Iranians, and it needs to be a broader coalition. And I think that coalition starts with the Iranian Kurdish parties. It involves other ethnic and religious minorities. 
the principle of federalism is a galvanizing force. And if Iranians agree that they want more local control over their affairs, then they can develop a inclusive plan that reflects everyone's interests. When we get around to mechanizing that, it's important that we are communicating effectively with the society. That's why whenever there is a regime change, the first thing that's done is to seize the airwaves and to use broadcasting as a way of reaching out to the people as a whole to let them know that there's an alternative to what's going on. I don't think we get to that alternative right away. I think we need to do more work. There needs to be a more internal debate, but it needs to be structural. It can't just be rhetorical. So the structural change that I think appeals most broadly and I think that this has been confirmed by the Iranian Kurdish parties, is to talk about federalism as a system of government that advances everyone's interests. And because it's inherently based on decentralization, it would marginalize the government in Tehran and hardliners there. Mm -hmm. So it's a step-by-step -step process. The Kurds can take the lead, but they need to broaden the coalition to include other groups. So we have uh, 13 more minutes and uh, I'd like to advance the conversation from the strategic points that David made um, to um, the international politics concerning Iran. Salah, do you think um, that it is all these occurrences in Iran and the protest movement, human rights violations that Tara mentioned, um, should be a reason for uh, the West, especially the US, to, um, to stop nuclear negotiations with Iran? Or should these negotiations continue regardless of, uh, of what's happening in Iran, like it happened with the Soviet, uh, Republic, uh, Soviet Union in the past, like what happened with, the, with North Korea in, in recent past, that the nuclear deal with Iran is essential for the global security and cannot be uh, sacrificed for um, for human rights issues. Do you agree that uh, that the nuclear negotiations should be a separate topic and should continue as is? Uh, we can't hear you, Salah. You're muted. Yeah, I think we should look at this issue, what you said, from different perspective, you know? In one side, maybe people believe or majority of Iranian now believe the regime should be changed but from perspective of the, of the European and uh, maybe the current US administration they're looking more uh, critical engagement trying to diffuse what they call the you know the nuclear issue Iran still they believe still they believe talking and signing so so-called deal which is was really it wasn't it was failure in 2015 Revive, you know, reviving that deal, it could, you know, save the world and region from another race, nuclear race. So uh, we have it. Yeah, this debate because I saw just a few days ago, uh, Jack, the same question was asked to Jack Sullivan, asked from the from Net Price, you know, all the, the touch of this this question. They said, uh, you know, they we are going to do the nuclear deal. Nuclear deal is separate from the human rights issue, and and it was big question for reporters or maybe uh, activists and people around the world. You are signing a deal with the, this regime when it is the most, you know, it's been most isolated regime in the world beside North Korea and Russia recently joined the club, you know, and uh, by signing this deal, you allowing to import this oil, you know, to find the market, is money, it's been freezed, blocked, he returned this money and estimated between 50 to 70 billion dollars you know, the regime can handle that money. What that money going to spend? Is going to, Iran regime going to build the hospitals or uh, schools or, you know, for, no, that money, which is the same money in 2015 returned to Iran when in 2015, everybody thought uh, Bashar Assad was not going to even stay in power. But he's in power, he's, he's you know, he's uh, visiting uh, some countries in the region and uh, we didn't know anything about Houthi at that time, but now they are become big factor in the very, uh, you know, the peace talk in that country. The Hezbollah become big power. So Iran is those money, majority of those money 
went to the proxies of the uh, regime in the region. So can, we say, can you say um, engaging in the nuclear deal with Iran uh, will certainly empower or advance Iran's aggression on the popular movement and minorities? Definitely. No, I'm not against uh, any nuclear deal or Iran be free of nuclear capability. But what mechanism do you have? You know, you sign a deal with Iran uh, with the giving the, those big chunk of money to the regime. And plus, the regime is uh, at the verge of the worst is human right violation, human right, you know, crackdown its people and cross-border killing. So this is, I don't know what the justification, you know, what the European West as a mechanism can separate this thing. I, I, I can't find answer for that. You can ask about the justification to Tara. Tara, as a human rights defender, do you feel betrayed that the West is continues to engage with Iran on the nuclear deal while uh, all the catastrophe happening inside Iran? As a human rights lawyer, um, my, my job is and has always been to talk about human rights violations in Iran, especially in Iran, because that's something I've been monitoring for several years. Um, and Iran is clearly not responding. We see that statements the last the past few days we have seen statement from the UN and from Western country, although I think this is good that they are acting um, when it comes to international law and international human rights law. Um, I think that a lot of people are disappointed of the outcomes with the legal tools we have we are restricted I can make it very short. Um, there is a way and that's international law and there we have legal mechanisms tools, such as the Security Council and just me saying the Security Council, I think you all know how limited that possibility is. But we have other legal tools, um, and that is to, to bring a lawsuit against the Iranian regime for U.S. federal court. Although these, these legal mechanism or inter, international law mechanism we have uh, are limited or restricted, I think we should still believe in, in, in the human rights mechanism that we have and that they are if we collect my, uh, evidence other ways to make sure that the perpetrators will be held accountable, for example, in U.S. federal court. Um, but it is, it is, of course, concerning uh, that um, the Iranian regime is not responding towards the U.N., the U.N. Special Rapporteur, year after year of saying that you have a severe human rights problem in your country. You are severely violating international law. And they are well aware of that. And we haven't seen any change, just desperate moves and increasing the violence against its people. Um, I think that the, the West and the international community should continue to pressure Iran. We've seen in the past with several laws inside Iran that pressure do have some effects. Nowadays, we don't because the, the violence is increasing. Without saying, I don't think we should stop believing in, in, in international community and international attention, uh, putting more pressure on Iran. Tara, this was very enlightening. Thank you. Um, we are approaching the end of uh, today's discussion within four to five minutes. But I, we can't take any questions think, today because of Dr. the... Dr. Phillips uh, want to say something, sorry. Yes, please, go ahead. Do you want to say it now, Salah, or do you want to wait? No, Dr. Phillips want to say it was a hand up. Just sorry. Okay, I didn't see it. So it's always better to negotiate and cooperate than confront. We saw in 2017, when the US withdrew from the JCPOA, that, that was used by the regime to assume a harder line. So the US should stay at the table. Mm -hmm. We should do that and be steely eyed. Does anyone really think that Iran is gonna make an agreement and stick to it? If there is an agreement on nuclear issues, the only way it works is if the government itself is held accountable by the Iranian people. So from a tactical point of view, in the near term, the US should continue its negotiations. But as long as this regime is in place, the likelihood of making a deal and then in monitoring and enforcing a deal is very small. So we need to take a long-term view. Uh, we don't want the Iranian regime to accuse the West, the US in particular, of scuttling nuclear discussions but we should be steely-eyed about the process. It's going nowhere unless the Iranian people hold their government accountable.
And this might be the motivation for them to hold the government accountable if the popular movement uh, expands and continues. So we clearly have a division in the world now between autocracies and democracies. Uh, you know, the events in Ukraine make that clear. Now we should recognize with absolute certainty that Iran is an autocratic regime, it's unreliable, and it's not a good international partner. That doesn't mean that we break off talks. We just have to know going in with eyes wide open with whom we're dealing and then find the right combination of carrots and sticks, which include the Iranian people as enforcers of any deal. Thank you, David. Um, I'd like to wrap up this conversation with, um, with one of the questions I saw in the, uh, in the chat group. Um, which I found interesting. And um, I, I find it a way to also summarize what we have been talking about as this panel uh, was designed to speak about the Kurdish issue per se, but we ended up speaking about everything that concerns Iran. I'd like to direct the, 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 the final question to Arish in a very precise way. Arish, are the Kurdish movements, parties, groups, um, not only your party, but uh, but the entirety. Are you ready for a um, a disaster scenario? Are you ready? Are are you making any preparations uh, to defend the Kurds against potentially expanded regime brutality? Are you preparing to uh, to to confront the Iranian regime in Iraq? And in Iran, in in in, in case if, uh, if if attacks are uh, conducted against you and other political parties, I want a quick answer, please. Uh, to be very quick, I can say yes. Uh, we are prepared. We have always been prepared. You know, uh, the revolution started uh, in 1979 with a disaster in the first uh, two decades. The fight was going on uh, uh, and it was really heavy. And, you know, right now in the past few years, we have always been studying the situation and we have been studying hypothetical situations and how can we be ready for that? Uh, we are increasing our uh, capacities uh, on the borders, on the mountains and inside Iranian society. We're increasing our military capacities. We're increasing our you know, uh, organizational capacities inside Iranian society. Uh, look, we, uh, we know that uh, the reactions that the Iranian regime shows, uh, the, 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 the directions of the Iranian regime they basically show that they are afraid of us as much as, you know, uh, people in Iran are, are afraid of the regime. Uh, especially, you know, the regime is afraid of Kurdish political parties and they target the Kurdish political parties more frequently because they, they, they believe this as the, uh, the Kurdish political parties have shown that they are the most viable threat to the regime. Uh, we have been able to challenge the regime in Kurdistan and now with the surprisings, the effect of, of or effects of our decision, the effects are, or you know, the effects of our resistance has been challenging them in, uh, in the whole Iran. So uh, I believe uh, uh, we have been studying this and we are ready if something happens to go in full scale. Thank you very much. Arash, uh, Salah, Tara, David, thank you for all these uh, insightful uh, commentary. I, is there a question somewhere? David, do you want to say something? I saw your hand was raised. Just a quick comment that what yeah. they're really yeah. afraid of is freedom and representative government. The fact that the Kurds have come together and they've agreed on a roadmap for advancing their freedom goals and their democratic self-government must simply terrify the regime. If that discussion is broadened to include other ethnicities and then all Iranians, then you're laying the groundwork for sustainable political transition. Thank you, David. So once again, David, Arash, Tara, Salah, thank you for all these insightful comments and the discussion today. Um, we started with uh, um, summarizing the situation in Iran 
uh, from human rights perspectives, uh, from the perspectives of the political situation in the country, but we ended up talking about its uh, regional ramifications and beyond, uh, especially with focus uh, with points focusing on what should be done by the Kurdish movement in the future. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for all the attendees uh, watching this and everyone who will watch this recording of this, this conversation in the future on YouTube. Thank you very much again. Have a great one.